So, good morning <coughs> again. <coughs> so we will continue with the Stokes problem today. Uh, let me summarize what we said yesterday. What I said yesterday. We are solving the Stokes problem, which is uh, um, written here. We know the functional setting. It's this one. That is the weak form. Then, uh, well, that can be written in this way <coughs> for a single a single equation. We also uh, saw that the, it is possible to pose the problem in the space of divergence-free functions. In that case, uh, the problem corresponds to the minimization of this functional, OK? In the space of divergence-free functions, j. By the way, I, yesterday I didn't mention, uh, do you know how is this, this derivative called? I mean, the derivative of a functional. You see, what we do is we fix u, uh, we take an arbitrary v, multiply v by epsilon, so both v is fixed, arbitrary or fixed, and then we take the derivative with respect to epsilon. So it's a sort of directional derivative in the, in the direction of v, right? How is it called? How do you, how, how do you call it? It's a direct derivative, but that, that has a name. In the case of functionals, that has a name. No, it's the other one. <laughs> it's the other one. It's the so-called Gateau derivative. That is the weak one. The Frechet derivative is, is the strong one, okay? But that is the weak one. That is the Gateau derivative, okay? That's the Gateau derivative. But that's the name, but the idea is very simple. If you take the derivative of that function with respect to epsilon, and that's zero, that's going to be a, a f of, at, at u, will have an, an, a critical point that happens to be a minimum because of this condition. Okay, then we moved, instead of minimizing in the space of divergence-free functions, we can, impose, uh, we can impose the minimization, or excuse me, the restriction through a Lagrange multiplier. That has the important uh, property that gives us the interpretation of the pressure as the Lagrange multiplier to impose the incompressibility constraint, okay? Then uh, we uh, consider penalty methods. We will see that, that they are useful for the theory, as we will see in a few minutes. And penalty methods are basically of two types. Either you take function f, functional f, either you take that functional, either you take that functional, and you directly penalize that. So you penalize the constraint. So you add so a very large number multiplying the constraint. Or you perturb the Lagrangian, as we will see in a minute. Um, so the penalize, the so-called penalize, it's not really a Lagrangian. Sometimes it's called Lagrangian, but it's not a Lagrangian. It's the original functional, the original one, f, penalized, or adding the constraint, penalized by a large number. It's a penalty method, OK? It's a penalty method. The, the variational equations are these, and the, uh, the differential equations, the Euler-Lagrange equations, if you want, are these. So the pressure in this case is 1 over epsilon divergence of epsilon of you, excuse me, divergence. OK, so we stopped here yesterday. There is another possibility, which is, uh, uh, which is similar but not equal. So that has to be understood. And that is very useful. It turns out, we didn't see that. I didn't, uh, I didn't want to pay much attention. But it turns out that if you consider that Lagrangian, so the original functional, enlarged with the restriction, enlarged with the restriction through a Lagrange multiplier, that Lagrangian is not, not, uh, not uh, definite. It's not definite. So it is very easy. I, I didn't want to do that. I, I'll do it now. But it, it, I, of course, I mean, the equations uh, that uh, optimize that Lagrangian are the original Stokes equations. So a u v minus b of p v equal l of b, and b of q u equals 0. But I said, if you remember, I said, uh, it turns out that the solution is not a minimum, but a subtle point. Okay? I said it's a minimum in u and a maximum in p. I said that. But I didn't check that. Why I didn't check that? I'll do that now. Because if you take the second derivative with respect to uh, the first uh, epsilon, so this argument, if you take the second derivative with respect to epsilon, I, I mean, it, I haven't done that, but it, it's easy to see that it, it's going to be a of u, u. A, okay, a of u, u, which is positive. So, in fact, we have a minimum with respect to epsilon. We really have a minimum with respect to epsilon. But what about, uh, excuse me, a minimum with respect to u? 
Okay, the velocity has a minimum in the solution. But what about the pressure? The pressure, I mean, it is from here it's easy to see that that function is linear with pressure. If we, if we take second derivatives, that's going to be zero. So <coughs> we have, I, I told you, we have a subtle problem, problem, but we haven't checked that yet. So you know that uh, uh, in subtle points you have a minimum in one direction and a maximum in the other one, right? So that's that's the uh, that's the situation, okay? So that would be a minimum in u, and I said it's a maximum in p. But it turns out that the Lagrangian is not definite. So in fact, we don't have a second derivative positive, <coughs> excuse me, a second derivative negative in the p direction, but we have a second derivative that is zero in the p direction. But I told you nevertheless that there is a, uh, there is a maximum in p. Uh, we will check that in a minute. And th the way to check that is in perturbing the Lagrangian. So that Lagrangian is not definite in the p direction. OK? Understand that this is the same as as, as for as for functions of, uh, of fi in the spaces of finite dimension, okay, of, of, this, of several variables. It's the same. So let's do that. Let's perturb the Lagrangian to make it definite. And what, what which is the way to per to perturb the Lagrangian? It's this one. You take the Lagrangian. That's the so-called perturbed Lagrangian. You turn the Lagrangian, and uh, uh, you see it, that's what it said here. Um, the Lagrangian with respect to the multiplier is not uh, defined. Well, in fact, it's not defined, it's not correct, it's not definite, it's not definite, neither positive nor negative. One can define then the perturbed Lagrangian, which consists of adding a, a, a small uh, number multiplying the norm, the L2 norm of the, uh, of the multiplier. This is a standard technique of, of regularization of, of Lagrangians. Okay? Uh, it can be either the norm or any positive definite bilinear form of the, of the, Lagrange, of the multiplier. So this is a general technique. Now, it holds that first the second derivative with respect to epsilon twice. That's what I said before. Is a of v v, which is positive, and the second derivative with respect to epsilon two happens to be. By the way, the, the, excuse me. That that, that that term should be deleted. This uh, should not appear. That term. Oh no, excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. That, that, that epsilon is not the same as that epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, okay? That, that is a small number introduced to regularize the problem, okay? So be careful with the notation. It is uh, the, us the usual one. So this epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are the epsilons with respect to which I take the, the direction of, of, the, of differentiation. But that epsilon is a, a small number used to regularize the Lagrangian, okay? So those are different things. So that is positive and that is negative. So that shows that we really have a subtle point problem. That's what I said yesterday. Okay, so a minimum in u and a maximum in p. So which are the equations of the uh, the equations of minimization of that Lagrangian? Those are the equations that we have to solve. So the equations are those. So we have the original Stokes equations plus this term, plus this term. Okay. I think it's easy to understand. When you take the derivative of this of this term, what we will get? Look, observe that we have a minus here and a minus here as well. So that's why we get the same sign here and there. Okay, but you could change the sign and and so so as to make the method symmetric. So this is very interesting. From the theoretical point of view, it's very interesting to take a look at this problem with a small number. Okay, so that is a regularization of the Stokes problem uh, uh, introduced by perturbing the Lagrangian uh, associated to that problem. OK, now that we have this variational form, which is the differential form of the problem or, or, or boundary value problem, associated boundary value problem? Of course, from the viscous term, we will get the same as in the case without perturbation, the viscous term. From the pressure term, we will get the same. From the divergence term, we will get the same. And we only have that additional term, which of course is epsilon, uh, epsilon p epsilon, um, because what we have done here is just test this equation against q okay so that does everybody understand that this is the uh, boundary value problem associated to the uh, optimization of the perturbed lagrangian yeah okay so uh, observe that this boundary value problem is exactly equivalent exactly equivalent to uh, this one to this one sorry to this one. Why is it exactly equivalent to this one? Because if from this expression you isolate the pressure, 
the pressure is going to be minus 1 over epsilon divergence of u epsilon, you see. And if you insert that pressure in, in this term here, what you get is exactly this, exactly this. So, you get the same thing. But we have arrived to the same boundary value problem from different point, uh, um, from different, uh, let's say, motivations or from different concepts. So, let me indicate what, do, what we have. First, we have the original problem, which is the optimization of F in J or the optimization of L in V times Q. Okay? So, th 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 those problems are equivalent. Then, uh, to introduce the restriction, we, in, uh, we stated the optimization of L1 epsilon. I think I called that L1 epsilon, which is the penalized, the penalized Lagrangian. Yes, L1 epsilon. Or, to re th is, that is the penalization of this method. So, the, the restriction is introduced through penalization. And here, we regularize this Lagrangian and we optimize L2 epsilon. Okay? So, of course, these problems are equivalent. Okay? These problems are equivalent. Then, from this optimization, we get a set of uh, a boundary value problem, let's say, excuse me, or let's say a variational form, the variational form penalized uh, 1, and here we get the variational form penalized 2, penalized. And then we obtain the boundary value problem penalized 1 and the boundary value problem penalized 2. Okay? The boundary value problem penalized 2. So, which, is, which are these problems? So, the boundary value problem penalized, this is the variational form, this is the variational form 2, this one, this is the variational form 2. Uh, this this is the boundary value problem 2. And previously we had the variational form. This is the variational form. That one is the variational form epsilon 1. And this is the boundary value penalized epsilon 1. Okay? That's the situation. Those are, this is the situation. And that, has in, that, that is important. Uh, Above all, from the theoretical point of view, as we will see in a minute. So, these two boundary value problems we have seen that are equivalent. Okay, are equivalent. And in principle, these two are equivalent as well. Oh, they, they, these two at the continuous level are equivalent as well. However, we will see that when we approximate numerically the problem, these two problems will be different. Why? Because going from here to here, makes use of the fact that point-wise, point-wise, the pressure is minus 1 over epsilon divergence of u epsilon. However, when solving that using finite elements, when solving this using finite elements, so th this, this will happen also in, in case 1. In case 1, the pressure is going to be always <coughs> minus uh, 1 over epsilon, epsilon divergence of u epsilon. However, in case of uh, the bilinear form 2, when solving this problem, the pressure will not be point-wise 1 over epsilon divergence of the oxide. Okay? Why not? Because it will be equal to this only in a weak sense when tested against Q. Okay? When tested against Q. Good. Uh, some remarks. One is, in, one is interesting because this is a, a useful trick that you can use in the in, in the applications. It turns out that um, if, Q, uh, if we take Q constant in that expression, in this expression, if we take a constant Q, what we get is this, integral of uh, epsilon integral of uh, over omega of P plus the integral of the divergence of U epsilon equal to what? Since using Gauss theorem, that's going to be the integral over the boundary of, um, of the normal component of u epsilon, and this is zero, that will be exactly zero. So, no matter how small epsilon is, the integral of the pressure is going to be zero. So, the mean of the pressure is zero using this method. You see, the mean of the pressure is zero. Therefore, 
you don't need to prescribe or to define the pressure up to a constant because that constant is defined by the condition that the mean pressure has to be zero. You understand? So, you don't have to define pressures up to constants anymore. The space for pressures is this one, is the space of functions which are in L2 with zero mean. And that space happens to, happens to be isomorphic to this one, as it is the trivial scene. What is the interesting thing? The interesting thing is that sometimes, what do you do in practice? In practice, what you have to do in a Stokes problem, or even in an average Stokes problem, when you have Dirichlet boundary conditions everywhere, is to prescribe the pressure at a point. Why? Because pressures are defined up to a constant. Okay, so you take a point and you prescribe the pressure there. However, it is sometimes not, let's say, very. Sometimes you may have problems. That's the first point. And, and other times, it's not nice to look at the mesh, which is the point where you want to prescribe the pressure to be zero, because that's of course an artificial value, a completely artificial value. Okay. So what is sometimes convenient? Sometimes even if you don't need that at all, even in, if you don't need that, it is interesting to introduce that term, this one, with epsilon very small. It doesn't help. You're not playing with penalization. You introduce that term just to make sure that the mean of the pressure is zero. It's, it's a very useful trick. Uh, that the sec that's the second com the, the, that's the remark I made. At the differential me uh, level, both the penalized and the perturbed Lagrangians lead to the same boundary value problem. That's what I said before. Okay, that is obvious. And the second remark is the something that I said already yesterday: is that in elasticity, this makes full sense because epsilon is not a fictitious number that has to be very small so that one over epsilon is very large, but in elasticity. Um, uh, 1 over epsilon is the so-called bulk modulus, okay, in elasticity, which is the young, Young's modulus divided by y minus twice the Poisson coefficient. So in incompressible elasticity, the Poisson coefficient is 0.5, so this is uh, 0, and one, uh, this is infinity, so epsilon should be 0, okay. But um, you may take a value of, of the Poisson coefficient 0.49 or 4999 or whatever, and you are close to the incompressible limit, but not yet there. Okay, so that's the remark. Which are the objectives of this uh, chapter? So first, uh, theoretical. We will see. I will not prove probably the results, although the sketch of the proof is there. Uh, the existence and uniqueness results for uh, um, velocity and pressure, which are very illustrative. It's not only a theoretical exercise. Then. Um, the convergence of the regularized velocity and the regularized pressure to the exact velocity and pressure as epsilon goes to zero. Uh, yeah. Can you repeat the comment that you made on the case of pressure prescription and penalizing that is with all these little better computations? Can you repeat the assignments that you mentioned? Yes, yeah, uh, this, you mean that one? Yes. I said that I, I, in practice, <coughs> in practice, you have to prescribe the pressure at a point. Imagine you have a domain. Or you have a domain, and you have a mesh that uh, discretizes that domain. Okay, so since the pressure is defined up to a constant, you sometimes you have to pick a point to uh, to prescribe that uh, that constant. So in the code, what do you do? Um, you take the point, for example, the first point, whatever, because you it's, it's just completely fictitious. You have, you have you have to fix the pressure. Okay, so it's completely fictitious, and depending on the mesh, you don't know where that point is, so you have no idea. So when you see the pressure, you have no idea of how pressures go because, because depending on the way you have meshed the, the domain, uh, uh, you will have one mean value or another mean, another mean one. Okay, that's one reason. And then if you add that the small term, so you have that equation. If you add a small term epsilon p, and that that doesn't affect the calculation at all, but just by adding that term, you don't have to prescribe that anymore. You don't have you don't have to worry. You know that the pressure you'll get is such that the mean is zero. <laughs> you know, and sometimes it's that's that's nice. That's it's nice to know. I mean, it's just a pressure with zero mean, hmm? and um, that's one thing. In other cases, in other cases, in transient calculations, well, this is a little bit more elaborated, but in transient calculations. Everything works. Everything works as soon as the uh, initial condition for the velocity is divergence-free. Okay, but very often, 
what we all do in practice is we take an initial condition that is not divergence free. I mean, we just prescribe the boundary conditions and take the rest of velocities equal to zero and let the code go. Okay? What happens? It happens that there is a, what is called in, in, in technical terms is called parabolic regularization. Um, and you cannot take a look at the first time steps, so they are meaningless. <laughs> what happens in the first time steps are meaningless. But very soon, the, uh, the uh, solution regularizes itself. So even if you have started from a solution that is not divergence free, very soon the solution becomes smooth. Okay? Uh, that, that I know requires explanation. We will see a little bit about that when talking about Navier Stokes, but not much. The good thing is that, or the bad thing is that if you do that prescribing one pressure, for that solution that is not divergence free, you get spurious pressure gradients close to the point where you have prescribed that pressure to zero. Okay? That you, you observe that in practice. So you run the code, you have prescribed the pressure to be zero at a certain point because pressure is defined up to constants. And uh, in the initial time steps, you observe uh, spurious gradients of the pressure close to that point. Well, a way to remedy this is simply to add, to add this little term that, that works beautifully, so everything is smooth, nothing happens, it's, it's a nice term. So it's just a little remark, don't take that as a, as a big theory, it's a, just a, as a little remark. Okay, so I was saying that the objectives are first um, the existence and the uniqueness of the solution, then convergence of the regularized solution, the perturbed uh, solution to the exact one. And then the, the two main topics of this uh, chapter are how do we approximate uh, our velocity and pressure spaces using finite elements, and in particular the conditions that have to be met between uh, the pressure and the velocity. That's what I mentioned already um, uh, in previous sessions. And then that, that's, uh, um, that our concern is uh, to work on a stabilized the finite element methods in the framework of the variational multiscale concept, and we will see that it is possible, so the answer is yes, it is possible to avoid those conditions by using the stabilization methods that we, we have seen in the case, in the general case of the convection diffusion reaction equation, and that now we will apply to the Stokes problem. Uh, the, the Stokes problem is a rich problem, even though it looks very simple, it's a rich one. There are many other uh, issues that we will not touch, but that are important, for example, uh, uh, is it possible to approximate the uh, space of divergence-free functions by a finite element space that is a subset of this uh, space? Those are the so-called solenoidal velocity interpolations. Uh, well, this is very difficult in general, but it's possible in some cases. However, if instead of working with conforming approximations, so conforming means that the finite element space is a subspace of the continuous one, you work, for example, with discontinuous Golurkin methods, which are very popular nowadays, or have been very popular in the last years. This is uh, possible, and, and there are several papers dealing with that, and, and, and there is a certain interest of constructing divergence-free approximations using this, uh, uh, the so-called discontinuous Golurkin method. In fact, uh, what about approximations that are not conforming? In the literature, there are some famous interpolations that are not conforming, that are velocities that are not strictly included in the velocity space. Well, that, that is almost impossible, okay? <laughs> Pressures that are not in L2 is not possible, but that, that is there. So what happens is that in some cases, there are popular elements, we will, maybe I will mention some, that are not uh, conforming, okay? But uh, we will not see that. Okay, let's go to the basic theory for the continuous problem. Okay, the basic theory. Maybe we will go a little faster here. Uh, let's see. We want to prove that the solution exists and is unique. Okay, so there are essentially two paths. One is uh, this one, the path that I will follow now. The, first of all, the, the first theorem is almost trivial. There exists a unique solution to the Stokes problem posed in J. What is J? Remember, J is H1 with divergence free with the divergence free condition. So the space of functions in H1 that are divergence free. In that space, the problem is this one, and the existence and uniqueness of solution in this problem is trivial. Why? Because it's just Lux Milgram's lemma, which you probably know. And Lux Milgram's lemma, by the way, is uh, uh, well, it's uh, just associated to the fact that it is coercive. Okay. Good. 
So that's it, nothing. The, the, pro the solution to this problem exists and is unique. By the way, well, this is a remark here that I haven't done. In some cases, ah, in some cases, you know that instead, if you start from the equations of continuum mechanics, instead of writing the viscous term as minus nu Laplacian of u, you have to write it as uh, minus nu um, or minus two minus two nu divergence of the symmetrical part of the gradient of u, where the symmetrical part of the gradient of u is one half of gradient of u plus gradient of u transpose. Okay, that is what um, in elasticity is called the strain rain tens uh, the strain the the deformation tensor. Um, it, and in, in fluid mechanics, it's called the strain rate, that strain rate, rate tensor, okay? So I don't know. Well, a, in this case, you don't have Poincaré's inequality. So because remember that we have to, we have to make sure that, to, for example, to prove, co to prove coercivity, we have to make sure that the, um, the gradient controls the L2 norm with a constant that depends on the domain. Uh, when you use this expression, the symmetrical gradient, you have to make sure that the symmetrical gradient controls also the L2 norm. Okay, so this is Poincaré Friedrichs, we remember? This is Poincaré Friedrichs. Well, this happens to be true as well. This is called Korn's inequality. It's not Poincaré Friedrichs, but, but Korn's. So that's just a remark. If instead of using the bilinear form that we have been using so far, we use this one. By the way, there is a two missing here. If we use this one, then instead of Poincaré Friedrichs, we have to use Korn's inequality. Anyway. Okay, now that, that means that there exists, uh, that, that, that gives us the existence of velocities. What about the existence of pressure? Well, it's not difficult at all. First of all, we have to rely on that result that you know, Helmholtz decomposition, which states the following giving a vector field which is L2, there exists a unique decomposition into that vector field into a part that is divergence-free and a part that is uh, the gradient of a scalar function. Hmm? So W can be uniquely decomposed into a function V which, whose divergence is zero and a function and a vector function which is the gradient of a scalar function Q. So if W is in L2, if W is in L2, that function V has to be such that the divergence is in L2. It's going to be zero, but it has to be in L2. So the, the, the space of functions whose divergence is in L2 is called H dip. Okay? H dip is the space of functions whose divergence is in L2. So it's, it's much larger than H1. Okay? It's much larger than H1 because imposing that the divergence is in L2 is much less than imposing that the whole gradient is in L2. Okay. Good. So that condition has diverged. That that velocity. Has, excuse me. That that vector field has divergence equal to zero, and the normal component on the boundary is zero. And that other field has to be such that the gradient, the gradient of Q, has to be in H uh, in H. Uh, excuse me. In L two. Therefore, Q has to be in H one. And since it is defined up to constants, because if I add a constant, the gradient is the same. The space for Q is this one, H1 uh, modulo constants, okay? And it turns out it is very easy to, to check that the uh, L2 product of this function and this function is equal to zero. It is immediately checked because this one is divergence free, okay? This Helmholtz decomposition, it's very easy. Um, in physics, it has a lot of applications. It is said that every vector field can be split into a solenoidal part and the gradient of a scalar function. Do you know how our gradient feels um, called in physics? Well, maybe in physics and also in mathematics sometimes. So vector fields that are called are the gradient of a scalar function. How are they called? So the vector fields that are divergent free, are divergent free are called solenoidal. This is uh, mathematics is also used, but above all in physics. And vector fields that are the gradient of a, of a function are called which is the terminology used, are called potential fields, okay? Potential field. A potential field is just a vector field that is the gradient of a function. They are uh, irrotational because the curl is zero, so you can call them either potential or irrotational fields, okay? In simply connected domains, of course. 
Okay, that's the proof, but uh, the proof is very simple. So the, the orthogonality is trivial, and then the uniqueness is trivial, and then the way it can be found is just by assuming that the solution exists and constructing it explicitly. Uh, is, is, is a trivial proof. Okay, once we know Helmholtz decomposition, uh, we could prove, although we need a little bit of functional analysis, we could prove this result. If Look at this result. Suppose that we have a linear uh, a, a form that is a form n that goes from our space v to the set of real numbers. That is linear, so it's a linear form, and continuous, so it is bounded. Continuity in, in infinite dimensions is equivalent to boundedness. Suppose that there exists a linear form, continuous and bound, uh, unbounded, uh, so bound, linear and bounded, such that it is zero. That form has is zero for all vectors in J. Remember, J is the space of divergence-free vectors. Then there exists a scalar such that n can be written in this way. Can be written in this way. This is not a trivial result, although it might seem trivial. So it says that if the kernel of n, so if the kernel of n is uh, J. Then n has this form. Okay, that's what it says. So it's, it's a way to all forms n such that the kernel is J can be written in this way. Of course, for that n, the kernel is J because J is made of functions that have divergence zero. So re recall that n is defined everywhere, okay, in the whole space V, but restricted to J in zero, so n has to be of this form. This, tri uh, this theorem is not trivial. It's not. It's based. In fact, the proof is uh, uh, two lines, <laughs> but uh, the first line is what is really uh, difficult. There is a representation theorem, so you have to know a little about functional analysis. I don't know how much you know, but it's not exactly a risk representation. It's a version of risk representation theorem. So you know what risk representation theorem is. So it's a version of risk representation theorem that shows allows. Uh, it, it's in Banach spaces. Not in risk representation is in Hilbert spaces. So that. Uh, is a representation theorem, in fact, in Banach spaces. Uh, Risk representation theorem allows you to define, the, um, to show you that, uh, or allows, allows to guarantee that n of b has to, has to be, ha, can be written as the duality between b and a certain vector field w, that is a duality, not really an L2 product. That's why it's in Banach spaces, not in Hilbert spaces. And then you have to use the Helmholtz decomposition for w. So you have to use this result. This Helmholtz decomposition for W, for that uh, element that uh, appears in that representation theorem. But now, now that we have this result that is not trivial, that allows us to guarantee that the solution to the Stokes problem is unique, not only in velocities but also in pressure. Why? Because we just have to define a certain form n, which is given by this expression. Once you have u, that we know that u exists because of uh, of the first uh, theorem, we know that u exists, then we can, can define n in this way. It happens that n of v is equal to zero for v's in j. We know that because for v's in j, u that belongs to j solves the problem a of u v equals l of v. So for v's in j, n is zero. Okay, we know that. And then we just have to use that, re that representation theorem to guarantee that that there exists P, which is in L2, such that this N, this N is equal to P divergence of V. And that's it. Okay? Because now you move that to the left hand side and this to the right hand side, and you're done. We get the existence of the pressure. Okay, so that's one way. Okay? In fact, that way is not what we what is uh, I think most uh, interesting. There is another proof that I prefer. This one is is perfect, okay? But there is another one that uh, for us is maybe more interesting, which is the, the line that is explained here, is this theorem. In fact, it's, in, it's general, but we, we will talk about the velocity and pressure. Suppose that V is the velocity space and Q is the pressure space, and A is the viscous form, which we assume is uh, continuous and coercive, and coercive, okay? Continuous and coercive. And we have the other, another bilinear form B, which is defined in the product space uh, pressure velocity, which is continuous and satisfies the M subcondition. Because, you know, here, 
in the previous in the previous proof everything relies on the fact that we are working in H1 and L2. So, that the velocity is in H1 and the pressure is in L2 okay, and the Helmholtz decomposition is in those spaces. Okay. However, now we are working in abstract. Uh, we are working for any space uh, of pressures Q and any space of velocities V. So, now we have to guarantee that that inf subcondition holds. That is the same inf subcondition that we found when, uh, when we first uh, saw the Stokes problem. Okay. If that holds and n and, and then L, the bilinear form, the right hand side is also continuous, then there exists a unique solution to this problem. Okay? So, this is a, a, a proof that I, I consider preferable because it makes explicit the condition that Q and V have to satisfy. Of course, in the previous method, that condition is also hidden. Why? Why it does not show up? It does not show up because it automatically holds for Q equal L2 and V equal H1. And that was proved by a lady called Alice Sky. I will go back to that later. Okay. So, that, um, that result states existence and uniqueness of that mixed problem. Okay. The proof, I think, is very um, illustrative. Here is only a sketch of the proof. Okay. Only a sketch of the proof. How is that proved? So, I will not uh, give uh, do the details because that would take half an hour. It is not difficult, but um, it is very illustrative, I think. The first thing is that we consider the regularized problem. You know, the problem that comes from the perturbed Lagrangian. That is why I have uh, talked about that. We consider that regularized problem. For, for that regularized problem, the Lux, directly Lux Milgram guarantees that there exists a solution for all epsilon. Why? Because the bilinear form associated to this problem is coercive. You see that? Do you all see that the problem is coercive? Why? Because when we take the test function equal to the unknown and consider the global, the sum of these two equations, when we take the test function equal to the unknown for velocity and pressure, these two terms will cancel. But here we will have that term that is coercive and that one that it is obviously coercive as well. Why is it coercive? Because it is just epsilon norm of P squared. Of course, it is positive. Okay? Of course, the coercivity constant is epsilon and when epsilon goes to zero, coercivity is lost. Okay. However, for epsilon fixed and positive, we have existence and uniqueness directly by Lux Milgram's theorem. Now, once we have existence and uniqueness, we can obtain a bound for both the norm of u epsilon in V in H1 and the norm of P epsilon in Q. That can be used, those can be shown to be bounded independently of the epsilon. Independently of the epsilon. So, first, the bound for u is trivial because that is what we obtained uh, 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 for in the previous sessions for the Stokes problem alone. The bound for u is trivial because when we take v equal to u, um, this is 0 because uh, or this is positive because of this, uh, it is not 0, but it is positive, and we immediately get a bound in terms of the right hand side. And for the pressure, we have to make use of the inf subcondition in a similar way to what we did um, the other uh, for in the in the discrete case you remember we obtained a base so we can obtain bounds for u epsilon and p epsilon independent of epsilon making use of the inf subcondition now i don't know if you know that result but there is a result in functional analysis that says you, you know uh, this uh, result that says that if you have a sequence of sequence of real numbers that is a bounded sequence, there exists at least a convergent subsequence. Okay, how is this called? Oh, Weierstrass theorem. Yes, yes. <laughs> Weierstrass theorem, okay? One of the several Weierstrass theorems. In infinite dimensions in functional analysis, it is almost true. Now, what we will do is to let epsilon go to zero. We have a sequence. Uh, think of this as, for example, epsilon has to be small. Think of it as 1 over n and, n, n, and 1, 2, 3, and you let n go to infinity. So, you can think of that as a sequence, okay? And because you want epsilon 10 to 0. So, think of this as a sequence. This is a bounded sequence. 
But in finite, in, in finite dimensions, uh, it is not true that there exists a subsequence that is convergent. It's not exactly true. What is true in infinite, uh, in, in infinite uh, dimensions, because H1 is on, of infinite dimensions, is that there exists a, 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 a subsequence that is weakly convergent. That's what this symbol means. Weakly convergence as epsilon tends to zero. What does it mean, weakly convergent? Weakly convergent means that <coughs> the only thing you can guarantee, you say that a sequence un of functions is weakly convergent to u, weakly convergent to u, if for all v in the dual space, or the, this in a space v, for all v in the dual space, u n dot uh, duality with v converges to u duality with v. Okay? That's what um, weak convergence means. Okay? Well, it's a little weaker, but uh, in, finite, in, in variational problems, it's what we really need. Okay? What we really need is weak convergence, because we always test the equation against the test function, and, let, uh, and, and then we can take the limit. Uh, even if it is only a weak limit, it turns out, it can be checked, that uh, that limit is the solution to the problem. Because in fact, as I said, what we really need is only, so we can take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, and that u, epsilon, uh, u star and p star, even though in principle, then it happens to converge strongly, but in principle, the convergence is only weak, then it is, that is enough. Uh, to guarantee that the u star and p star, the limit is the solution to the problem with epsilon equal to zero. So that, that allows us to guarantee that the problem has a solution. Because by the way, th this limit does not need to be unique. But once you know that there is a solution, uniqueness is easy. But again, uniqueness is easy. It's just to assume that there are two solutions and the, the, uh, they have to be equal because the, the norm of the difference is zero. Again, to prove uniqueness, you have to make use of the Ipsum condition. So I like this proof. It's more constructive, let's say, than the other one. On, on one side, it's more abstract. We are in, in general spaces. And on the other side, it's more constructive than the other one, OK? Because it, it gives you the structure of the variational problem, which has consequences at the, this, at the approximation level when using finite elements. OK, so we are done. We have the theory for the for the Stokes problem, the basic theory for the continuous problem. And now we go to approximate that using finite elements. Perfect. We know all what we need to know for the continuous problem. So <coughs> the big theorem, the big theorem, that uh, the aim subcondition introduced through the big theorem. That's the big one. That is uh, uh, what uh, I already mentioned uh, in general. So this is babushka banach nekas theorem. Let B be a bilinear form in principle in different spaces, and li L a linear form, and we consider this abstract problem. If we can guarantee that v, B is continuous, which means bounded, boundedness okay, in finite dimensions, L is continuous, and that in subcondition holds, that in subcondition holds, then uh, the problem has a unique solution, and these are necessary and sufficient conditions for the variational problem to have a unique solution. So remember, I mentioned the other day that coercivity, which is much stronger than this, much stronger than this, is a sufficient condition, but not necessary. So this is not only sufficient, but also necessary. So the problem is well posed if and only if this is true. Okay? That's the big theorem. Um, it, is, it takes a while to prove it. In fact, it's based, it's, uh, as, as I mentioned the other day, Babushka just uh, wrote that in the context of um, variational problems used for finite elements. Uh, just uh, put that into context, let's say. Nekas was the one who proved that for, uh, uh, for variational problems. But in fact, uh, it's uh, an almost direct consequence of a, a theorem by Banach, which is the, 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 the difficult one. So there's a difficult theorem by Banach that was, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, applied to partial differential equations by Nekas, and then put in the context of variational problems by, by Babushka. Okay? And in fact, people in the finite element community know it as Babushka's theorem, but it's not quite, um, quite uh, fair. <coughs> OK. And that's, that's a remark that I already made the other day, but I want to insist on that. 
<coughs> we know what coercivity is. We say that, that the bilinear form is coercive if, if this holds, okay? And as I mentioned before, coercivity, co coercivity is sufficient but not necessary for the problem to be imposed. And that's the analogy you have to keep in mind. That's the analogy you have to keep in mind. So, <coughs> we are solving this problem, this variational problem, B, B of u, V equal L of B. Suppose that we have this algebraic problem that now B is a matrix, U is a vector, and V is a vector, and F is a vector. That's it, that is the um, algebraic problem. So see, if this has to hold for all functions V, then we have B of U equal F, of, co of course. Okay. So the equivalent is to say that B is coercive as a bilinear form is the same as saying that matrix B is positive definite as a matrix. We, we, we saw that the other day. You remember this? Because all eigenvalues, all eigenvalues have to be uh, positive. Because why? Because this is an estimate for the minimum eigenvalue. If this is positive and this is an estimate for the minimum eigenvalue, all eigenvalues have to be positive. And, that, and of course, asking for, the, uh, for B to be positive definite is by no means necessary. It's of course sufficient, but uh, by no means necessary. Okay. However, what we really need is that B, matrix B, is non-singular. And this is equivalent to say that the bilinear form is V-stable, so that the inf sub condition holds. Why? Because it turns out that this KB is also an estimate for the absolute value, absolute value of the minimum eigenvalue. Do you know what is that? If uh, this is... Um, if I compute the min max to, to know that this is a, an estimate, that estimate, if I take the min max, uh, the minimum with respect to one argument and the maximum with respect to the other, well, not one argument, if I take a matrix B, I multiply it by one function x, uh, by one vector x, and pre-multiply it by a vector y, and take the min max of this. This is an estimate for the minimum eigenvalue. This is a, an algebraic property. Does anybody know what is this called? Not the property, but this. Coefficients. What? Coefficients. How do you call it? Couldn't Fisher. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't say it's not called couldn't Fisher, but I never heard that name. That that is called somebody's caution. Riley's caution. That's it. Riley's caution. Riley's caution. Okay, which is an estimate for the minimum eigenvalue and absolute value. Okay, so I I, I never heard that name that you mentioned. Oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a consequence of what you say. Okay. So that is called, uh, that is known in Rayleigh's caution. It, uh, for example, this is very much used in structural mechanics. Those that, uh, of you that have taken any course in structural mechanics, this is important because in structural mechanics it's important to estimate uh, the minimum eigenvalue and absolute value of, of a matrix. For example, to, to, to analyze um, uh, the vibrations of, um, of a structure or something. Okay, so that's an estimate for the minimum eigenvalue, okay, for the minimum eigenvalue, which is, by the way, easy to check. It is easy to, to check. To, if you assume that B diagonalizes, if you assume that B diagonalizes, it's an easy exercise to check that that is an estimate for the absolute value of the minimum eigenvalue, assuming that B diagonalizes, okay? So that IMSEP sub condition is not that strange. It's just asking that B is invertible, so to speak, let's say, in some sense that V is invertible. So it's exactly what we need. Okay? It's exactly what we need. Why, why the, uh, the condition that we have met before? This is a condition f that we have met before in the case of the Stokes problem. That condition in the literature is known as Ladiszkaya babuchka brezik condition. Okay, first, uh, in the Stokes problem that we are analyzing now, our bilinear form is this one. Okay? That's the bilinear form that we have in the case of the Stokes problem. Okay? So, <coughs> 
we have an unknown that has two components. Our unknown has one component, which is the velocity, and another component, which is the pressure. So if we apply the previous result, this one, this one, we have to check that the infimum, the infimum um, of up times the supremum of bq of b of up comma bq normalized by the adequate norm of up and the adequate norm of bq this is greater or equal a constant post a positive constant okay that's what we have to check is that clear just applying the abstract result that abstract result to this Stokes problem okay however in our case B of UP BQ has a particular expression is A of UB minus B of PB plus B of PQU okay that is what is written here and it turns out and it turns out that this one is already coercive. So A of BV is greater or equal a constant norm of B squared. Okay? So it can be easily checked, and I leave it as an exercise if you want, then that, that because A is coercive, checking this is equivalent to check the following the infimum for the pressures of the supremum for the for the velocities of b of q b divided by the norm of q and the norm of b is greater or equal another constant let's call it this d prime because they are different so what is the point the point is that the abstract condition that we have seen before this one when you apply it to the stokes case in which the bilinear form has this uh, expression and A is already coercive happens to be equivalent to this expression not be between the uh, unknown spaces but only between the pressure and velocity space okay between the velocity and pressure space do you understand so this is an exercise that you can check easily so it's not difficult now why Lenskaya Abuchka Bredzi well Ladiszenskaya proved that this condition holds uh, when when uh, when Q is L2 and B is H1. But she didn't pay attention to that because that was just a, a, let's say a step that she needed in, in a proof in, in her book. A step that she needed in, 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 in a proof in her book. So he, uh, she didn't pay attention. She just uh, uh, went ahead and didn't pay attention. That's why, nevertheless, her name is here. Babuchka, because Babuchka saw, as we, uh, we have seen before, that that was the condition needed in the, in the finite element context. And Bredzi was the one that really applied that to the Stokes case in that form. And not only that, he, only, he, also, <coughs> he also proved convergence by assuming that that condition holds. Okay? So this is the Ladisenskaya babuchka bredzi condition. Let me ch check one thing. Could we stop here? Okay, so let's stop here because we will move to the discretization now. Okay, so now now that uh, we know the theory uh, for the continuous problem and we have s stated this uh, abstract variational uh, uh, this abstract result for variational equations, we can move to the discretization. Let's consider the discrete problem. So we construct a finite element partition of the domain omega. Now I call k the gen a generic element of size h, and we consider these finite element spaces. So the, the velocity will be continuous because we want the velocity space to be in H, a subspace of H1. Remember that that implies continuity. And uh, within each element, it will be a polynomial of degree K. Hey, here I have written R. R is, uh, the, um, is the space of complete polynomials of, of degree uh, K. So it can be either the polynomials of the, excuse me, of the degree P. It can be either the, the space of polynomials of the degree P in the case of triangles or in the case of quadrilaterals or hexahedra, the space of uh, polynomials of degree p in each direction. Okay. Anyway, that's just a number. Those are polynomials of degree uh, p. 
Okay, so by construction we have a, constru a conforming approximation because if velocities are continuous, they belong to H1. So, which is the Golurkin approximation to the problem? Easy, trivial, we just have to replace the continuous spaces V and Q by VH and QH respectively, as simple as that, okay? So we have to find UH in V and PH in Q such that these two equations hold for all test functions in the discrete spaces, okay? Okay, nothing else. Which is the matrix version of the problem? We already uh, saw that, so I can skip that. We have a matrix that multiplies the velocity degrees of freedom coming from the viscous term, another matrix uh, multi, uh, multi, uh, coming from, from the pressure gradient, and the divergence of the velocity equal to zero. Okay? And the components of these matrices are written here. And in principle, as, in the Stokes, as, as, we, have, uh, as we did previously, I have used the subscript U to denote the velocity shape functions and the subscript P to denote the pressure shape functions. So in principle, they could be different. Stability, okay, that's already also what we uh, uh, saw the other day. How do we get the stability? Well, for the velocity, it's very easy. We take the test function equal to the unknown and likewise for the pressure, and we get this. We use the coercivity, coercivity of A and we get this, A of u, u is greater or equal, the, the coercivity constant times the norm of u squared, this is equal to the right hand side, because uh, B of P u is zero, this, uh, the right hand side is continuous, and therefore we get a bound for the velocity in terms of the norm of the right hand side and the coercivity constant. You remember that? That's the same that we did. Any question? What about the pressure? I try to stress that the only place from where we can extract pressure stability is this term. That's the same argument that we used. So that is equal to the right hand side minus the viscous term, which we know is bounded uh, uh, by the norm of L times the norm of B plus the norm of A times the norm of U, which is bounded here, and L divided by KL and times the norm of B. So we know that this is a constant, this is bounded, okay? This is bounded. So uh, this is bounded by, by a constant times the norm of B. But if from here we have to extract pressure stability, the only way is this one. It, it's the only way. So given a pressure, any pressure, I have to be able to find the velocity, I have to be able to find that velocity, such that from this term, I can bound the norm of the pressure it's the only possibility. So it's a sort of inverse, inverse continuity. So I have to be able to find that. If not, I, I, I'm lost. Okay. If not, I'm lost. Um, and that means that is equivalent to say that the minimum uh, for all pressures of the supremum for all velocities satisfies that condition just by by dividing by b and by and by q. Of course, if this holds, I am done because I I, I, I use this expression. And I will have that the norm of P is bounded by this constant divided by KV, okay? That because the, uh, the norm of V will cancel. Uh, the my objective here is that you understand that that condition is very natural. This <laughs> is not uh, a mystery, and sometimes it's thought like a mystery. It's uh, something very natural. What is the main problem? What is the main problem? I said before that that Vladiseskaya. Ladiseskaya proved that in the case in which Q is L2 and V is H1, and she didn't pay attention. What is the real problem? That is true in the continuous case, but not true in the discrete one. If <coughs> coercivity, if the bilinear form is coercive, coercivity is inherited by the discrete problem, if we use a conforming approximation, by the way. Why? Well, it's not difficult to understand, I guess. <coughs> Suppose that we have a bilinear form that is coercive. A bilinear form that is coercive in a space V. Okay, so it's coercive in a space V. And if we consider, if we consider a subspace VH, if it's coercive for all functions in V, of course, it will be coercive for all functions in VH. 
this is obvious, right? But what happens with the M sub condition? For the M sub condition, let, let me write it, let me write it in in the form that I think is more illust illustrative. For all Q H, for all Q belonging to Q, there exists V belonging to V such that uh, K B norm of Q in Q norm of V in B is smaller or equal B of Q Q B. Okay? That's the subcondition. condition. So we have the velocity space, the pressure space, the finite element subspace, the H and the finite element subspace Q H. Okay? So what's the problem? I know that this holds at the continuous level. So if you give me QH, I'm sure that there exists a V in V such that this holds. But nobody guarantees that this the, 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 the velocity associated to this pressure is going to belong to the velocity space. It might very well lie outside. You understand? So Coercivity is inherited by the finite element approximation, but the IMSUB condition is not. The IMSUB condition is not, not necessarily. So, uh, you give me a function Q, I know if I, you give me a function QH in, uh, in, Q, in capital QH, I know that I will find the velocity satisfying that. I know. <laughs> but nobody tells me that that velocity is going to belong to VH. Do you understand? That's the, the, the reason why the M sub condition has to be explicitly required. So, that's the main problem. So, you have to explicitly require that the velocity pressure pair satisfies the M sub condition. And this is not trivial. And in fact, there were years in which uh, everybody found uh, um, uh, an element that was stable. Uh, published a paper <laughs> okay so it was by no by no means uh, it is by no means easy in general which are the methods to check that compatibility there are several you see it's the uh, the the, the ages where they were developed essentially in the in the in the 80s,80s. Ferfur was uh, famous because of this of his original method Volan Nicolaides and Stenberg perhaps is the most uh, let's say uh, handful method, the macro element technique is the, perhaps the most powerful also. Those are methods which are, we will not consider that because we are interested precisely, we will see that we, our interest is precisely not to have to satisfy the M sub condition, but there are methods to check it. Okay? Stenberg's method is perhaps the most powerful one. There is an example, although it's not very, very let's say, it doesn't apply to many elements, many elements but for, for a certain elements, uh, you can use what is called for thin trick to prove that the use of, uh, condition is satisfied. And the for, for this trick is the following. If you are able to construct an operator that goes from V to VH, okay, an operator, such that when uh, B, the, for B, the divergence of, Q, uh, or if you want, the integral of QH times the divergence of B minus that operator, think of it as a projection, is equal to zero, well, and that operator is continuous, then the pair satisfies the M sub condition, and the proof is trivial. Uh, you, you can just read it. So, but the point is, in some cases, so if you are able to construct this operator, then you guarantee that the M sub condition holds. But the problem is that that operator is not always easy to satisfy. This is just an example, so I don't want to insist in that because it's, it's more, let's say, historical, um, of historical interest rather than application because now we know which are the elements that satisfy the sub condition. In the engineering community, there is a sort of confusion basically because of uh, an idea introduced by Zinkevich and Taylor and, and, and others, oh, Zinkevich and Taylor essentially, that is useful but is not uh, neither necessary nor sufficient. So that, let me explain that. So let's think at the algebraic level. The algebraic, or the algebraic level, yeah, which is this one. These are, this is the, this is the system that we have to solve. Okay, this is the system that we have to solve. Suppose that there exists a solution. Okay, suppose that there exists a solution. If there exists a solution, U has to be uh, like that. 
if the solution exists, u has to have this expression. It's f plus the minus the gradient of the pressure, and then the inverse of matrix k. Okay, that's the notation introduced here. So you move this to the right hand side and k minus one. Okay. And now that uh, you have u, you insert u in the equation for the pressure, and you get this expression. Uh, divergence of u equal to zero is equal to that. Divergence of u is divergence of k minus one f plus divergence of k minus one divergence transpose p. Okay. Okay. So this is the when you do that in a in a system in a, in a, in, a, in general in general in a system of this type in a system of this type when you obtain the equation for p in this way. Does anybody know how is it called this ma this matrix? How is this matrix called? The matrix uh, the matrix of the let's say Lagrange multiplier in optimization it's exactly the same. The matrix of the Lagrange multiplier when you condense is, is the word that is used. The, the, the this is, u is called the primal variable and p the Lagrange multiplier. When you eliminate u. And write the equation for the Lagrange multiplier. Do you know how this matrix is called? It appears in other in other situations as well. In domain decomposition, for example, it's called the Schur complement matrix. Okay, it's called, have, have you ever, have you heard of this name? Yeah. It's called the Schur. Anyway, that, that's that's irrelevant. Okay, that's irrelevant. That's the Schur. Anyway, that doesn't matter. Uh, what is the point? The point now is that, that if that has a solution, look. Suppose that we are sup assuming that that, that 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 system has a solution. So which must be the rank of this matrix? The rank of this matrix has to be the number of pressure unknowns, okay? Because we want this system to have a unique solution. So the rank of this matrix has to be the number of pressure unknowns. On the other hand, for a matrix with this structure, the rank of this matrix is as small or equal the rank of k minus 1. Because if you pre and post multiply by a matrix, you can never increase the rank of k or k minus 1. The k and k minus one have the same rank, of course. And which is the rank of k? If we want the system to be solvable for the velocity, has to be the number of degrees of freedom of velocity. Okay, so it's very simple. So the the uh, the, the bottom line is that if you want the system to be solvable, the number of degrees of freedom of velocity has to be greater than the number of degrees of freedom of pressure. So the argument by Zinkiewicz and Taylor and others was. If I can find the partition, well, they didn't call it in this term. They, they, they talked about the so-called patch test. But if you find the partition of, of the domain in which it is possible to obtain the number of velocity degrees of freedom is smaller than the number of pressure degrees of freedom, then the method will not work. That was his, uh, his argument. Okay. Well, yes and no. Uh, that if you find the partition uh, has to be taken with a lot of care. So that 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 counting that counting variables of variables is useful, but there are examples and counterexamples in which it doesn't work. Okay, so it's just an indication, I would say, rather than a, a rule. Okay. Well, what happens if you solve the that cavity flow problem with an element that is not in superstable? You see that cavity flow problem. I think you are running that as an edge as a, in the in the lab session. So it's just a square with a velocity a horizontal velocity prescribed on the top, and the uh, solution is more or less like that. So in that, if you use, for example, linear and linear inter equal interpolation for all variables, you get a reasonable velocity. That is not perfect, but it's reasonable. If you look at it carefully, you will see that there are points in which it seems to oscillate. You know, here, for example, you have a velocity that goes in this direction. Then all in a sudden it moves more to the left, and then it, moves, it goes to the right. So it's not perfect, but it's not bad. But pressure is terrible, you know. I said the other day that you have control on velocities if you don't satisfy the IMSUB condition, because this element does not satisfy the IMSUB condition. If you don't satisfy the IMSUB condition, uh, you have control on velocities, but you don't have control on pressure. So pressure is, you know, something completely useless. Okay, which is the abstract conversion theorem? Uh, if you satisfy the IMSUB condition, well, that's what is written here. It's it's very easy to understand. If you satisfy the IMSUB condition for an abstract variational problem, you have the following. Suppose that we solve this problem, okay? 
And suppose that uh, we have the if subcondition for in the discrete spaces, in the discrete spaces, and we have these two properties. I don't. Yes, I have the proof here. So it's very. It, I, I, we will prove it. <coughs> it's very. It's very easy. So it's very easy. So <coughs> you you have this. Okay, it's the, the if subcondition. And then you have this consistency estimate, which says, which says that it's not exact consistency, it's just approximate consistency, which says that the bilinear form of u minus u h dot co <coughs> comma v h is ha is bounded by a function that goes to zero <coughs> as h goes to zero. <coughs> <coughs> sorry, as h goes to zero times the norm of um, the norm of of v h, the test function. Okay. In the Galerkin method, this is zero, exactly zero. I mentioned that the other day, yesterday. Okay, we have exact consistency in many methods in the Galerkin and in stabilized methods. In most stabilized methods, this is also zero. But that does not need to be zero. The only thing you need is that this is bounded by a certain function. And then you have this other estimate, which says that uh, the infimum for all functions in the finite element space of the norm of u minus any function is bounded by this function. So this function epsilon of, F of h, the element size, is the interpolation error. So you see that the interpolation error does not depend on the method. The interpolation error depends only on the finite element space that you choose. So if you manage to prove that the error between u minus uh, so the, the exact solution and the approximate solution, behaves as this interpolation error, you're optimal. You cannot expect more than that. Because this is the error that comes from the interpolation theory. Okay? And that's what this theorem guarantees. If the im subcondition holds and you have uh, a consistency error of the same form as the interpolation error, then the error of the method is this one. Okay? This is a very general result. In a sense, it's uh, the equivalent to Lax, Lax theorem. Do you know Lax theorem? of ordinary differential equations that says that if you have a method that is stable and consistent, it is convergent. You know, that's Lax theorem. So that's the equivalent. If you have a method that is stable and consistent, it is convergent. Okay? But it's very easy to prove. We will see that in a minute. Let's prove it. <coughs> First, we do the following. We will use the coercivity. You, we use the coercivity of, uh, of um, excuse me, not the, the im subcondition of B. So UH is the finite element solution. Remember, UH is the finite element solution. Okay? So I take an arbitrary function in the finite element space. And I know that for this arbitrary function, there exists a B, there exists a B for which this holds. Okay? Because of the im subcondition. You give me this, so this is any function you want. This is the finite element solution. For this function, which belongs to the finite element space, for this function that belongs to the finite element space, I can choose B such that this is true. OK? So far, so good. Now, once I have this, I add and subtract U. You see? If I add these two terms, U cancels. U cancels. So that would cancel with this. You see? Very easy. Very easy. Everything is easy. And I, I have used the, B, the fact that B, uh, B is linear, of course. Now, I use the continuity of B because B is continuous. So this is bounded by the norm of B times the norm of this term and the norm of this one. Plus what? I now I use the consistency error. U minus UH is not maybe necessarily zero, but it's bounded by the error function times the norm of VH. Good? So what do you see now? You see now that this cancels. V cancels here, V cancels here, and V cancels here. So yet we don't have that function that exists anymore. V cancels. We have it on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. And now we have to use tri the triangle inequality. We have U minus UH, that's what I want to estimate, is bounded by U minus U hat H, any function, plus U hat H minus UH. So this is U minus U, uh, U hat H plus U hat minus uh, but I have just got a bound for that. This is nb div divided by kv, you see nb divided by kv, times this norm, this norm, plus a constant, that constant c, divided by kv, 
times the error function. And uh, I'm done. I am done because uh, this is just the error function. And I know that this behaves also, this and this. You see that these two terms are equal. This term is equal to this one. This also behaves as the error function epsilon. So I'm done. The error behaves as the error function epsilon with different constants. You know that, by the way, I haven't said that, but uh, when in, in numerical analysis, when we write a constant c, it means any constant. Uh, now, now, now it's more popular to use that symbol greater or equal with the the sim underscore. Okay, that, that greater or equal, with the, that is more popular now. That, that is that means inequality up to constants, and that's it. So that's a, a result as important as that is uh, trivial to prove. So what do we have to check? What is the real problem when you have a method and we have uh, any method? You what you have to check is that the method has the good interpolation error in the good norm, in a certain norm, because that norm is not necessarily the working norm. In a certain norm, we have you have the good interpolation error. And the bottleneck is always to prove stability in the form of in subcondition. So for any method, 95% of the work is to prove stability. I mean, when you look at the paper and you see theorem 1, theorem 2, theorem 3, theorem 4, 90% of the theorems are trivial. Or trivial, or the idea is very simple. Okay. There is only one theorem that really matters, the stability theorem. OK, the stability theorem. So you can fill uh, 40 pages of a paper, but maybe only the three pages devoted to stability are the real important ones. OK, okay. <clears throat> let's apply that to the Stokes problem. It's, it's a straightforward. In the Stokes problem, the, the unknown is velocity and pressure. The unknown is velocity and pressure. Uh, the space, the working space is this one. So be careful with the notation because uh, we have called that so far V. And for the Stokes problem is the product of space VH times QH. The bilinear form is this one. We have exact consistency. That's, uh, that's uh, what I was saying before. We have exact consistency. And we have the in subcondition. We have the in subcondition. And therefore, we will have, uh, ah, by the way, and we also have our um, interpolation estimate. That's our interpolation estimate that I uh, already mentioned. So we have uh, our spaces are H1 for velocity, L2 for pressure. And therefore, the error in H1 is H to the power of k and the k plus 1 semi-norm. I could replace that by a semi-norm, not by the whole norm. And for the pressure, which belongs to L2, uh, sorry about that. That should be L plus 1 here. So L, uh, H to the power of L plus 1, H to the L plus 1 where L is the interpolation order for the pressure. Okay. So that's what it is. That is the interpolation function for the, that is again L plus 1. That is the interpolation error for the Stokes problem. So we have, the, may, may, the, maybe the only thing that is important to stress is that we have, um, uh, in the error function, we have a term that comes from the interpolation error of the velocity and another one that comes from the interpolation of the pressure. And they are coupled. They always go together. So you cannot split the error of velocity and the error of pressure in general for the Stokes problem. OK. And uh, here I have uh, something the, that I mentioned that can be done in the Stokes case and also for the Poisson problem, uh, which is moving from an, an estimate in H1, because our norm for the velocity is H1. OK. We can obtain a, a norm in L2 which is uh, one order higher. Okay, So um, I mentioned that in the Poisson case, or in fact, in the convection diffusion equation. And uh, we have that here for the po uh, Stokes problem. So it is also true. The only condition we need is that uh, that sort of that condition that is called um, elliptic regularity. Let me explain that. Suppose that the Stokes problem, written here in other variables, is such that when f is in L2, when f is in L2, z, the solution, is in H2. z is in H2. It's very reasonable to think that, but it's not trivial. And uh, g is in H1. Suppose that this is true. Suppose that this is true. Then it happens that the error in the solution, in the velocity in L2, is one order of h higher than the error in H1, which was epsilon. Okay. Remember that that function, the error function epsilon of h, was the error uh, in H1 for the velocity in L2 for the pressure. So the L, in L2, you gain one power of h, which is what corresponds to interpolation error. 
Does anybody remember under which conditions uh, these, uh, these holes, under which conditions in the domain omega? I said two examples. Which were the examples? A little more. Convex, convex is not enough. Convex polygon, exactly, a convex polygon. Or? C2. Or C2, C2. exactly. Exactly. So that, that, that regular enough, uh, in particular, uh, sufficient conditions are convex polygon or C2 boundary. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it, it, those are sufficient conditions for that to hold. We really don't know exactly uh, a general case in which uh, this is. Uh, so those are sufficient, but the necessary condition for that to hold is not known. Okay? We know sufficient conditions. OK, so in fact, I have the proof here. Uh, the proof is not difficult, you see. It's, it's, it's uh, just a few lines. Let me explain the idea. The idea is to solve a problem to solve this problem in which the right hand side f is not any function but the error I want to estimate so that the right hand side is u minus u h that's the idea so the this is called a duality argument okay this is called a duality argument so you take f equal to u minus u h and then you take you test this equation against u minus u h so what you get is u minus u h squared in L2 equal to what? Equal to a of z a minus u h, so because uh, that's the test function I've taken, plus b of g a u minus u h. Okay, that's what you get. So that's the starting point. I will I, I will not follow the details, but this is the starting point. Okay, do you understand? That's the that, then it's very easy. In fact, it's adding and subtracting things. Here I subtract z h, I add z h, I, sub, um, I can um, subtract uh, g h because of, of, uh, of consistency. Uh, anyway, it's, 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 it's just playing a little bit around. And at the end, and at the end you have to use elliptic regularity uh, to know that z and uh, g, the velocity solution and the pressure solution, z in h2 is bounded by the right-hand side is bounded by the right hand side but the right hand side happens to be u minus uh in l2 so you have u minus uh in l2 and u minus uh in l2 this cancels with this square and you have uh, an improvement of degree h in the solution so it's, you, you will follow that uh, easily so it's the so it's the um, that is the so called uh, ovin nietzsche's trick ovin nietzsche's trick which is based on a duality argument OK, so now it comes where we have to see, OK, we are in a situation in which uh, we know that uh, we have to satisfy the imp condition. So which elements do satisfy the imp condition? As I said before, uh, in the 80s, everybody that found an element that satisfies the imp condition published a paper. So let me, rep uh, let me show those elements, the elements that satisfy the imp condition. For example, with discontinuous pressures, so the same holds in 3D. So I will make the... Uh, um, explanation only in 2D. The elements that satisfy the imp sub condition with these continuous pressures are those. What does that mean? The, the, the black bullets are the, are the velocity degrees of freedom, okay, or the velocity nodes, of course. For each node, we have two degrees of freedom in velocity in 2D, of course, it's a vector. And the triangles are the uh, pressure degrees of freedom. Okay. So what is this element? This element, I don't know if you have heard of this element. Is the, well, I'm sure you have heard of this element uh, in, uh, in velocities, which is the biquadratic element in velocities, Q2 in velocities, okay? Q2, Q2. It is possible to have a complete second order polynomial removing the central node, okay? Which is this element here, which is called Q2 minus. Has anybody seen that element? Is called the serendipity element. Uh, just, uh, just uh, uh, general culture. The, ser the serendipity element. So that's not important. And in this case, pressures are piecewise constant, and in this case, pressure are piecewise linear, but discontinuous. You know. So this is me this is meant uh, to represent a linear pressure. So that that is why it is given by three values. Three pressure values defined uniquely a linear pressure which does not need to be continuous between elements so that's why we need to uh, we we can put the degrees of freedom in the interior of the element okay 
So that element is the so-called Q2P1, meaning that we have a bi-quadratic uh, bi interpolation for velocity and linear, linear interpolation for pressures. Not bilinear, but linear. And here we have this serendipity interpolation for velocities and piecewise constant for pressures. In the case of triangles, here we have a quadratic interpolation for velocities and piecewise constant pressures. And here we have a bi-quadratic, excuse me, quadratic interpolation for velocities and enriched with a bubble function, enriched with a bubble function and piecewise linear pressures discontinuous like in this case. Okay? So these four elements are m sub stable. Does anybody have any question about the interpolation of velocity and pressure in these elements? And here is the simplest element, which is bilinear in velocities and piecewise constant pressure. And the bad thing is that this, this element does not satisfy the M sub condition. But this is, it's a very peculiar element because not, does not satisfy the M sub condition only if meshes are regular. <laughs> It's a strange element. So if you have a complicated mesh, it works. But if the mesh is too structured, too simple, then it doesn't work. Why it doesn't work? Because it has a spurious mode, it said. I, I, that's not the topic of this course, but it has, a, it has a pressure that is not zero, but whose discrete gradient is zero. It's the so-called checkboard mode. Anyway, I cannot uh, go into the details, but this element the, the, the message is this element almost always works except if the mesh is too structured. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it was a, an element that gave a lot of, uh, let's say, attention about 20 or 25 years ago. What about continuous pressures? For continuous pressures, we have three clear elements, which are those written here. So in this case, we have that. that now I have written the, pre or I have drawn the, the, uh, pressure degrees of freedom with that uh, circle, that big circle, empty circle. So uh, we can use biquadratic velocities and bilinear pressures. You see, the uh, the order of the pressure interpolation is one less than the order of the velocity interpolation in all cases. So these these are biquadratic velocities and bilinear pressures. That works. And you say you have the same uh, the analog in the triangular case. You have quadratic velocities and linear pressures, that elements also work. Those two elements are called, are called Taylor Hood elements. And that is the element that I mentioned the other day. That is the element that I mentioned, the so-called mini element, which is an element that works. For velocities, we have a linear interpolation enriched with a bubble. You remember that? And for pressures, you only have a linear interpolation for pressures. So that, uh, that is the simplest element that satisfies the M sub condition. So in, 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 the, in the other slide, we had uh, elements with discontinuous pressures. And in this slide, we have elements with continuous pressures. Why are pressures continuous? Because I've taken the degrees of freedom at the nodes, and the nodes are shared by the neighboring elements. And therefore, pressure is continuous, as we, as we said. I will skip that. This is something that I left here. I wouldn't say by mistake, but um, it's the three-field approximation to the Stokes problem. And we will um, stop here. Okay, that's it. We'll see, uh, this afternoon we will uh, talk about the approximation of the optimization problems.